Long before there were the 50 United States of America, there were the 13 sort of united colonies of Britain. And it was during that time in the first half of the 1700s that a young man named David Brainerd from the colony of Connecticut went off to Yale University to study to become a pastor. And although he was a bit sickly, Brainerd was a bright student with a promising future of ministry ahead of him. The First Great Awakening was just beginning, and unlike our day when political protests are sweeping across campuses, back then religious revival was spreading like wildfire. Famous preachers like George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards spoke at Yale, pouring even more fuel on the spiritual fire. But much like today's campus protests, there was a sharp divide between the students and the faculty. Some of the faculty were opposed to what appeared to them to be unbridled religious fanaticism. Unfortunately for Brainerd, he became something of a scapegoat after commenting that one faculty member, quote, has no more grace than a chair, end quote. For that careless remark, he was promptly expelled. What made matters worse was that at that time, Connecticut law required all church ministers to be a graduate of either Yale, Harvard, or a European university. And try as he might over the next several years to repent and reconcile, Brainerd was never readmitted as a student. His dream of becoming a pastor was over. I wonder if you've ever experienced a similar sort of detour in your life. If life really is a highway, then it must be a highway under construction because there sure are a lot of detours. You know what I mean? Perhaps you were injured your senior season and didn't get to play. Or maybe you were working your way up the professional ladder only to have a major career change forced on you. It could be that sin blew up your marriage or that marriage still hasn't happened yet for you. Perhaps you were looking forward to growing old with those you love, but sadly, they were taken from you far too soon. Whatever the case may be, in this sinful, fallen world, there are all kinds of detours and disruptions to our dreams that may cause us to say, you know, it wasn't supposed to be this way. The question is not if there will be detours in your life, The question is, how are you supposed to handle them? What are you supposed to do when your life does not go according to your plan? Whether you miss out on your dream job like David Brainerd or your Monday afternoon just doesn't go according to your schedule, life is full of disruptions. And while there's a lot that can be learned from Jacob's story recorded in this chapter, I believe there's one main truth that Israel needed back then And you need today in order to properly navigate all of life's ups and downs and detours. That truth is this. Nothing can stop God's plan for your life. And in the first half of this story, we see that God's plan for your life is to bless you. Look with me beginning in verse 1. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. In chapter 28, Jacob begins what he expects will be a brief detour in his life. Jacob has deceived his brother twice out of his rights and blessings as the firstborn, and now Esau wants Jacob dead. So Jacob's mother, Rebekah, sends him off until his brother can calm down, and Jacob's father, Isaac sends him off until he can find a wife. The plan is for Jacob to spend a little time with Rebekah's family in Haran, hundreds of miles to the northeast, roughly the same distance from here to Pittsburgh. On his way there, Jacob has this incredible experience with God where he receives the promise made to his father Isaac and to his grandfather Abraham. God promises to bless Jacob and to bless him and all his descendants and make them a blessing to all the families of the earth. After what was likely a month-long journey, Jacob finally arrives, verse 2. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it, for 
Out of that well, the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large, and when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. As we've seen throughout the book of Genesis, wells were an important source of water in the ancient world, and many of them were covered like this one to keep them from getting filled in or going dry. Verse four, Jacob said to them, my brothers, where do you come from? They said, we are from Haran. He said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, we know him. He said to them, is it well with him? They said, it is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. Laban is Rebekah's brother, Jacob's uncle. Jacob just so happens to show up at the right place at the right time. Verse 7, he said, behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. The shepherds wait until everyone is gathered together, possibly because the stone was so large it took all of them to move it, or possibly because water was scarce in that arid land and they wanted to make sure everyone got their fair share of such a valuable resource. The story reaches an important moment in the next verse when Jacob's future bride appears, verse 9. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. You might have noticed, but that last verse repeats this phrase, Laban, his mother's brother, three times. The point is that Jacob has found exactly who he's looking for. Everything is going according to plan, but after basically running for his life for a month, Jacob is overcome with emotion when he finally meets his extended family, verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. When Laban hears that another member of Abraham's wealthy family has shown up, he quickly runs to meet him. But to his disappointment, Jacob does not come riding in on tricked-out camels loaded down with expensive gifts. Laban must have been wondering what's going on. So verse 13 continues, Jacob told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, "'Surely you are my bone and my flesh.'" or as we might say today, my flesh and my blood. And he stayed with him a month. Now, as we went through this story, I wonder if it sounded familiar to any of you, because it should. This story is eerily similar to the story of Abraham's servant meeting Rebecca back in Genesis chapter 24. First, there's the almost identical command given by Abraham to his servant and Isaac, his son, to go and take a bride from Abraham's kinsman in Mesopotamia. Both men go on a long journey northeast to the exact same area of Mesopotamia. Both men arrive at the well just before the future bride arrives. As a matter of fact, it might have even been the exact same well. In both stories, animals are watered and there's an emotional response when the discovery is made. Both Rebecca and Rachel ran and told their families, and both times Laban runs to meet the men. And there are even more commonalities, sometimes down to the very same words that are used. These stories are nearly identical, but with this major difference. In Genesis 24, the Lord God is mentioned 26 times. But in this story, not even once. What's going on here? Is God just taking a break this time around? No, not at all. God is still there. His providence is still directing every single detail of this story. It's no coincidence that after a month-long journey, Jacob just happens to show up at the right place at the right time and finds exactly who he's looking for. 
It's not a fluke that the future love of his life just happens to appear moments after he arrives. The difference between these stories is not with God. The difference is with the men. Although we are never even told his name, Abraham's servant is clearly a godly man. From the beginning to the end of Genesis 24, the servant puts God first, seeks God, prays to God, praises God, and gives all glory to God for his success, but not Jacob. Jacob has had an amazing, one-of-a-kind spiritual experience with God. He had a vision of angels going up and down a ladder to God in heaven. He had been given God's promise to Abraham, but afterwards, he completely ignores God. Unlike Abraham's godly servant, when Jacob gets to the well, he doesn't pray and ask God for success. When he meets his future bride, he doesn't bow his head and worship God. When he meets Laban, he doesn't give a lengthy, detailed account of all of God's faithfulness in his life. He doesn't even mention or acknowledge God at all in this story. Jacob acts like he's completely forgotten about God's promise to bless him. But what is perhaps even more remarkable than Jacob ignoring God is God blessing Jacob. Jacob clearly doesn't deserve God's blessing, but nothing can stop God's plan to bless Jacob even when he sinfully ignores God. It's so strange, isn't it? I mean, who does that? When we bless other people and do good to them, we don't want to always be ignored. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Everyone wants to be appreciated. Nobody wants all the years of hard effort they've put in on the job to go unnoticed. It doesn't hurt to get a handwritten note filled with gratitude after you've gone out of your way to show kindness to someone. Even if it's just a simple thank you every now and then for doing the dishes or taking out the trash. Moms, you know exactly what this is like. How many diapers have you changed? How many meals have you cooked? How many messes have you cleaned up? How many guests have you hosted? How many rides have you given to practice or to school or to the doctor? How many times have you gotten up early and stayed up late to bless your family and bless others, and you've not gotten a single word of appreciation for it. Countless times, I'm sure. And that's hard, and it shouldn't be that way. But moms, I want you to know this, that by continuing to bless others, even when you're not recognized for it, you are tangibly reflecting the image of God because that's what God is like. He's so good, he's so gracious, that he won't stop blessing us even when we ignore him. The danger is, if, if we're not careful, we can act just as sinfully as Jacob. Each Sunday morning, we can come in here and sing and pray and hear God's word and have this amazing spiritual experience. But then we can walk out the door and when the alarm clock blows off on Monday morning, we can cruise through the rest of the week on autopilot and act like God doesn't even exist. If we're not careful, we can encounter minor disruptions to our schedule or major detours in our lives. And instead of remembering God's blessings, we can fixate on ourselves and our problems. Like Jacob in this story, we can sinfully ignore all the blessings God gives us or we can choose to acknowledge them. And the simplest way that I know how to do that is to begin and end each day with prayer. When the alarm clock goes off in the morning, as soon as you turn that alarm off, don't just grab your phone and start scrolling. Before you start racing to get ready in the morning, just look up and simply whisper, thank you, God, for another day to serve you and serve others. While you're in the shower or on the way to work, instead of dreading all the things you've got to get done that day, spend that time thanking God for his mercies, which the Bible says are new every morning. This is why I think that the simple yet often overlooked practice of praying before meals is important. 
We're not commanded to do it, even though Jesus regularly did. But if you make it a habit, then if nothing else, at least three times a day, you will remember to stop and acknowledge God's blessings. And because we are so prone to forgetfulness, we need that regular reminder. And finally, as your day ends, put that phone down. And as you close your eyes and drift off to sleep, just go through your mind and rehearse all the good things, all the blessings that God gave you on that day and thank him for them. Trust me, God will still receive that prayer of thanksgiving even if your amen sounds like a snore. If we get into the habit of acknowledging God's blessings on a daily basis, then we will be better prepared to handle the detours that happen in our lives. Even if we don't understand everything God's doing by disrupting our plans, we can at least be sure he's still committed to bless us. We'll be able to navigate the detours with thanksgiving instead of complaining because we know that nothing can stop God's plan for our lives. His plan is to bless us. And in the rest of the story, we see that his plan is to make us a blessing. We pick the story back up in verse 15 after Jacob has spent a month living with his uncle Laban. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, But Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel. The word translated there as weak could be translated delicate or soft or even tender. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Leah was ugly. It could just mean that Leah had nice eyes, but Rachel was the full package. Notice how the text emphasizes that there are two sisters and Rachel is the younger one, just like there are two brothers and Jacob is the younger one. Verse 18 continues. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. Unlike Abraham's godly servant who had lots of money at his disposal, Jacob has shown up in Haran with nothing more than the clothes on his back. So he's in no position to bargain. But we also know from the story of his mother's betrothal that Laban is a greedy man. So he happily accepts Jacob's offer, which would have been more than twice the going rate for a bride at that time. Verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. You might think this is when Moses, the human author of the book of Genesis, expected everyone to go, oh, how sweet. But maybe not. Remember, this was only supposed to be a brief detour in Jacob's life. But what was supposed to be a short trip has turned into seven long years. This is not going according to Jacob's plan. And unfortunately for him, it's only going to get worse. Verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. Notice, first comes love, then comes marriage. Then comes consummation in the need for all the baby carriages. That's in the next chapter, as we'll see. But that is the biblical order. Remember that. Verse 22. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. The original word used here for feast specifically refers to a banquet with wine, to a drinking party. Remember that as we go through the rest of the story. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Oh, the irony. The deceiver has become the deceived. Now, lots of people try to give Jacob a pass here and say things like, well, you know, 
Back then, women wore veils over their faces and there wasn't any electricity, so at night it would get really dark and it was hard to see. No, excuses, excuses. In all likelihood, Jacob was drunk. After spending seven years slaving away for his uncle, Jacob probably lets loose a little too much at the wedding reception and drinks so much that his vision is blurred and he doesn't even recognize who he's sleeping with, just like his ancestor Lot. To this day, when someone gets extremely drunk, people will call them blind drunk. And that's probably what's going on here, which is why it's so ironic. Jacob deceived his blind father into giving him the blessing of the firstborn, and Laban deceives blind, drunk Jacob into blessing the firstborn by marrying her. They both were wined and dined and deceived. In response to Jacob's self-condemning protest, his uncle coldly responds in verse 26, "'It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also, in return for serving me another seven years.'" Greedy Uncle Laban is not going to give his nephew a two-for-one deal. If he wants to marry Rachel, then he's going to have to renew his contract for another seven years of hard labor, verse 28. Jacob did so and completed her week, that is the week-long wedding festivities. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. Jacob serves 14 years for his wives, and as we will see, another six years for his own flocks. That means he spends 20 years slaving away for a crooked boss. Talk about a major life detour. That doesn't sound like a blessing, does it? What happened to God's plan to bless Jacob? Well, an important lesson we learn from this part of the story is that suffering is often a blessing in disguise. Think about it. As Jacob left the promised land, God promised to bless him and to make him a blessing. But in order for that to happen, Jacob's character needs some serious work. He's a lying and conniving, deceiving and thieving sinner. So God, in his providence, sends Jacob on a major detour and allows him a taste of his own medicine. This is what the scriptures refer to as God's discipline. The Bible says that God disciplines those he loves as a father does his child. Remember that, parents. God corrects corrects us even if it's painful for our good so that we may be holy as he is holy and so we may become channels through which his blessings can flow to others. That means God allows this suffering in Jacob's life in order to make him a fit instrument of his blessings to all nations. And that in and of itself is a blessing. It is a blessing that God does not allow Jacob to continue down his deceitful path headed for certain destruction, but puts a detour in his life. Nothing can stop God's plan to bless Jacob and make him a blessing, even if Jacob must suffer. And if you are a child of God here today, the same is true for you. God often uses detours and suffering in our lives to discipline us and shape us into the image of his son. And it's through that process called sanctification that we are blessed to become a greater blessing to others. Now, that doesn't mean every time we suffer or get stuck in traffic that it's the result of our own sin. But it does mean that God will do whatever it takes to make us a blessing. If he can use a wicked, crooked boss like Laban in Jacob's life, then he can use your boss or your lost family member or your cranky neighbor Instead of seeing suffering and detours as bad things to be avoided at all costs, we need to begin to see them as part of God's plan to bless us and make us a blessing. If we will see detours in life 
as God's blessings in disguise, then we will be better able to handle them and grow through those seasons of life, whether they last 20 minutes or 20 years. So when God redirects your path or your schedule gets disrupted, don't fight against it. Lean in to what God is doing and actively seek to be a blessing to others. When the checkout line is taking forever, don't just stand there and stare at your phone. Appreciate what God is doing to make you into a more patient person and strike up a conversation with the person behind you. Ask them how their day is going. Who knows where that conversation may lead? Or if you're forced into a major job change, then lean in to what God is doing to make you into a person whose peace is not found in your circumstances, but in him alone and share that peace with your new coworkers. Even if you are laid up on your deathbed, you can pray God's blessings down on others as Jacob does eventually at the end of his life. When your plans are messed up or you're suffering, the temptation is to focus on yourself. But in those moments, remember, God is still in control and he's using all of it to accomplish his good plan for your life. It takes Jacob all of 20 years, but as we will see in future chapters, in the end, he's able to look back and acknowledge God's hand in all of it. He arrived in Haran ignoring God, but after two decades, he arrives back in the promised land praising and worshiping God. He arrived in Laban's house with nothing but the shirt on his back and leaves with a large family and large flocks of his own. But best of all, he comes away as a changed man, fit to be God's blessing to all nations. Even Laban comes to realize that he has been blessed by God through Jacob. All along, God kept his promise. Nothing could stop God's plan for Jacob's life. Not Jacob's sin, not Laban's sin, not Jacob's suffering, absolutely nothing. And the same was true for Jacob's offspring, who went by the new name God later gave to Jacob. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Moses delivered the book of Genesis to the nation of Israel after they had just come to the end of a major detour. A journey to the promised land that was only supposed to take a matter of weeks turned into a matter of decades. After God rescued his people from Egypt, they ignored God's blessings and they grumbled against him. So God disciplined them and sent them on a detour into the wilderness for 40 years. Now, a new generation of Israelites is preparing to enter the promised land. And this story served as a reminder to them that just like God kept his promise and was faithful to their father Israel during and after his 20-year detour, God would keep his promise to them after their 40-year detour. Even in spite of all their sin and suffering, the promise had not changed. God would bless them and make them a blessing to all nations. Centuries later, that promise was fully fulfilled in the promised offspring of Jacob. And you know what happened to him? He was sent into the wilderness with nothing more than the shirt on his back. Like Jacob and the nation of Israel, this was all part of God's plan for him. But unlike them, he had no sin to be disciplined for. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness alone without God, but he did not ignore God. Though he suffered, he did not sin. He remained faithful, and after overcoming Satan's temptations, he returned to Israel to be the blessing to all nations, the Savior of the world whom God had promised. But did we recognize Jesus as the Son of God? Did we acknowledge him as God's greatest blessing? No. We cursed him. We mocked him. We spat upon him. We beat him, we shoved a crown of thorns on his head, and we nailed him to a cross and put him to death. Why? Because we were too blinded by our own sin to see that he really was who he said he was. 
And the sad reality is there are billions of people around the world to this day who are still ignoring God's blessing of salvation. To this day, they still do not acknowledge Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And some of those people are sitting in this room right now. If that's you here today, let me say to you, it's no accident that God brought you here. God has brought you to what could be the most important detour of your life. God wants you to repent, to turn away from following the world down the wide path of sin that leads to eternal destruction. By faith, trust in Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior and follow him along the narrow path of righteousness that leads to eternal life. Acknowledge that you are a sinner and that Jesus is your Savior and God will bless you with eternal life. And when that happens, you'll begin to see his blessings in all the details of your life. Even in life's hardest moments, even when you face death, you can have the confidence that God is still committed to bless you no matter what, because Jesus is alive. Not even death could stop God's plan to bless Jesus and make him a blessing to all nations. And since he's alive, we know the same is true for all those who follow him. The spirits of those who die in faith immediately depart to be with God and enjoy their blessed rest. But when Christ returns, their bodies will rise just like his did. And we will dwell with him in a perfect world of blessings. And on that day, when Jesus returns, every knee will bow and every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. But until we enter our rest, Jesus has given us work to do. He's blessed us and sent us out to be a blessing to all nations by making disciples of all nations. We are to go to the ends of the street and the ends of the earth to tell people the good news that by faith in Jesus, they can be eternally blessed. That's what David Brainerd did. His dream to become a pastor ended. That's because God had a different plan for his life. Not long after he was expelled, David Brainerd became one of the first missionaries to the Native Americans. He suffered greatly to preach the gospel to several different tribes. He was often sick, depressed, and lonely, but God used all of it to bless him and make him a blessing to the Native Americans. A small revival even broke out amongst them, and many were saved by God's grace through the ministry of Brainerd. But just when it looked like everything was going according to plan, he died of tuberculosis at the age of 29. But not even death could stop God from making Brainerd a blessing to all nations. The reason you and I know the name of David Brainerd today is because he kept a journal that none other than Jonathan Edwards published shortly after Brainerd's death. That journal went on to be read by countless Christians who were blessed by it, like William Carey, who was inspired by Brainerd to take the gospel to India, and David Livingston, who was inspired to take the gospel to Africa, and Jim Elliott, who was inspired to take the gospel to the Amazon. They and countless other missionaries like myself, whose names will never be remembered, read Brainerd's journal and were inspired to go bless the nations by spreading the gospel. You see, you just don't know how God's plan and all his detours are gonna work out in your life. But you can know without a shadow of a doubt that because of Jesus, nothing can stop his plan to bless you and make you a blessing.